Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men and women. Then they abandoned their nets and followed him. He walked along a little farther and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in a boat mending their nets. Then he called them. So they left their father Zebedee in the boat, along with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Normally on this Sunday in the week of prayer for Christian unity, we'd welcome a guest homilist from another tradition. That would be perfect for the Sunday of the Word, because the Word is what all Christians share. But we're not doing that this year, and I think you know the reason why. So then, why me? Although I've been a baptized Catholic since I was 16 days old, for many years, I've worked with a number of Eastern churches in both theological dialogue and the preservation of their manuscripts. In fact, this week, I'd normally be in Rome, or maybe somewhere more exotic, for the annual meeting of the International Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Oriental Orthodox Churches. For many of you, the designation Oriental Orthodox may be new. You've heard of Eastern Orthodox, and you may think that Oriental Orthodox is the same thing, Eastern, Oriental, identical meaning. Not so fast. The Eastern Orthodox in ecumenical speak are the Greeks and the Russians and the others in that imperial Byzantine church, which traces its roots back to that empire. The Oriental Orthodox are those from the edges or beyond the borders of that long ago Byzantine Empire. They come from places like Egypt to Syria, Iraq, Armenia, Ethiopia, India, places where the local churches parted ways with the Byzantine and Roman churches in the mid fifth century. The disagreement back then was over highly technical aspects of the relationship between the divine and human natures of Christ. With the passing of more than 1,500 years, arguments over a single two-letter Greek preposition have run their course. We've now concluded that actually we agree on the essentials of the faith and agree on the relationship between the divine and human natures in Jesus. Fifteen centuries to get there, but as we all know, churches move slowly. So now, instead of that, we spend most of our time talking about the practical differences that arose because our churches were out of regular contact for such a long period of time. And during that time, we've each developed our own ways of doing things, how we do baptisms and marriages and everything else you can imagine. And we also have different ways of understanding what we're doing. So we spent several years talking through sacraments and other issues. Now, given the locations of these churches, as I listed just a moment ago, current events take up a growing part of our dialogue time together. Most of these churches are in regions that at one time were largely Christian. But now, after centuries of Muslim rule, Christians are just a small minority. And some of them live in actual war zones, like Iraq and Syria, more recently Ethiopia, Armenia. 
Many of these churches are also seeing their ancient communities wash away like sand, and they deal with a sprawling diaspora of their members who've emigrated to Europe or to North America, looking for economic opportunity and political freedom. I've been on the dialogue with them through the Arab Spring, the rise of ISIS, and if we were together this week, we'd be talking about the civil conflict in Ethiopia and the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. As a matter of fact, in today's first reading, we heard about Nineveh, the city of the prophet Jonah. Today, Nineveh is called Mosul, the ground zero for the three-year ISIS occupation of northern Iraq. We've talked about Mosul a lot. Now, through these conversations, I've gained a much richer understanding of how unity in diversity actually works. We've learned to respect our differences, and we've learned to trust that all of us are disciples of Jesus, even if we have taken different paths. So did Simon and Andrew, James and John. Those first disciples received the same invitation from Jesus, but each responded to it in his own way. Now, for example, these churches have a collegial form of government in which the bishops elect the other bishops and the laity play a formal role in that process of election. I think we can learn from that. And we Catholics, despite all our challenges on the subject, highlight the work of laity and women in particular in ministry and share how our increasingly secular societies affect the life of the church. That's what dialogue is meant to be, an exchange of experiences. Now, all of this may seem very remote from Collegeville, even though members of these communities do live in Minnesota. But the basic themes of listening to experience, finding unity and diversity, speaking honestly, about things that make the dialogue partner uncomfortable. Well, those are pretty important lessons, especially now when we see our own country more divided than it has been since the Civil War. It used to be a daring thing for a Catholic and a Lutheran to talk theology, but we got past that. Now it's daring for a Republican to start a constructive and honest conversation with a Democrat and vice versa. And we all know that that has to change. And all of this political discord sits atop the fault lines of our nation's original sin, the sin of racism. Racism which justified dispossessing native peoples and enslaving African captives. And what does racism have to do with Christian unity? Everything. Early in the past momentous week, we had our annual remembrance of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who famously remarked, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Dr. King made that statement in 1963, shortly before the passage of the Civil Rights and then the Voting Rights Acts. And there has been progress in the decades since he made that remark but we all saw in the year of COVID and of George Floyd that there is much more to do. And in fact, the fault lines of race still run through the map of American Christianity. We Catholics like to think that we rise above discrimination and exclusion, and at our best we do. After all, Catholic means wholeness and inclusion. But our history, like that of our Protestant fellow believers, is also sadly littered with disregard for other cultures and the desire to remake them in our own image. So our takeaway should be that excavating history and speaking honestly about the pain we discover is the only way forward. Whether it's an ecumenical dialogue between churches in conversation between the descendants of those who enabled slavery and those who were enslaved, in the hard work of governing a diverse nation or making marriage, family, or community work. 
In today's gospel, we heard Jesus' first command to his followers, repent. Only if we repent can we hear the good news of the gospel for what it is, good news. And when we do so, we will hear Jesus telling us to be one, just as he and his Father are one, and to love one another as he has loved us. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we make the audacious claim of communion, even as the churches cannot yet gather around one altar. Christians of all traditions and races do share the word highlighted this Sunday, but our communion remains imperfect. Nonetheless, the Eucharist is still the strongest sign of our intention to be one. As we approach the altar this morning, let us hold fast to that intention and let us pray for the grace and the strength to achieve it. <laughs>